networking can feel overwhelming. And although there are lots of articles about it, very few of them give you real and actionable advice. I want to teach you how to make your own magical unicorn network. During my MBA internship, my boss used to jokingly say I had a magical unicorn network because even though I had only been at the company for five weeks at the time, I knew people across the company at all levels. It seemed like my network had magically come to be. However, the reality was it was the result of a significant amount of effort that I had put in behind the scenes. Before I even applied for an internship, I networked with over a dozen people at AT&T, and they invited me to apply for their leadership development program. Not because I was the most amazing candidate, but because I had built relationships with people, and they cared about me because of the time that I had spent getting to know them. And I keep in touch with many of those people to this day. I've spent the last decade building the foundation for large and small companies to succeed by enabling change through people strategies and internal management consulting. It's very relationship-focused work, and it requires building trust across the company for them to be willing to open up to me. I can't rely on just my own knowledge. I need people from different walks of life and different jobs to help me gain a deeper understanding faster than I can on my own. Part of how I'm able to do this is because ever since my first job, I've wanted to help other people to love and succeed in their jobs. This requires networking. In most professions, success is not based on what you know. It's based on who knows what you know and who knows what you need to learn. Despite this fact, early in my career, I used to hate the idea of networking. It seemed like people only networked when they needed something. And research backs this up, unfortunately. Zippy on LinkedIn did studies that showed 85% of jobs are filled through networking. Impressive. But less than half of professionals keep in touch with their networks when things are going well. This is not what networking is about. Networking is about building relationships. While most of what I'm going to share with you today is focused on the professional aspect of networking, I want to note that networks aren't just for people with my job or even just for work. Networking is about building a community of people who support you and you support them. Networks don't just go up. They go up, down, to left, to the right. They go all over the place. They show you your strengths and your weaknesses more clearly. They help you understand different views and perspectives. And they give you the opportunity to pay it back and forward. Networks should lift everyone up together. What I'm going to share with you are not sales techniques, but techniques to build real relationships with real people in a meaningful way. And I'm going to teach you how to network across three different phases, the invitation, the meeting, and the follow-up. When my wife and I went to Rome, we ran into another couple from the Midwest. In a place where everything was new to us, our shared Midwestern background gave us an instant sense of camaraderie. Have you ever run into somebody who comes from the same community as you or grew up in the same neighborhood? Have you felt that instant likability? These commonalities help us feel connected to one another. Your invitation is your first chance to build a connection, establishing an important part of your message, why they should care. You see, while people are not a numbers game, invitations are. If you reach out blindly, a very small percent of people will respond. But by adding in a commonality, something that connects the two of you, it makes it easier for them to want to say yes. If you really want to take your invitations to the next level, though, having somebody who's a mutual connection provide an introduction can increase your response rate tenfold. This isn't to discourage you from reaching out blindly if you have to, but to instead encourage you to find commonalities 
and get introductions when possible. Next in your invitation, you need to specify why are you reaching out to them specifically? Is it to learn about their job, the company that they work at, the city that they grew up in, or something else entirely? And related to this is, what exactly are you asking for? If this is your first time connecting with someone, you do not have a right to ask for a job. I want to repeat that again. You do not have a right to ask for a job. That first conversation is about building the relationship. I recommend asking for 15 to 30 minutes of their time to learn. I found that people want to share their experience and the knowledge that they have with others, but they also guard their time closely, as they should. By giving them clear boundaries for what to expect, it makes it easier for them to say yes. However, whatever you do, do not bait and switch. If you're going to ask for a job recommendation or a referral or something else, mention that up front so they can decide before they accept your invitation. Don't wait until the middle of the conversation where now they feel trapped. You have your short but friendly invitation now. Where do you go from here? As you think about that LinkedIn list of over 100,000 alumni from your school, it's easy to start feeling overwhelmed again. And that's why I created the 555 rule. When networking, each week or month, you can reach out to five people who you already know, reconnects, where you continue to establish and build that relationship going forward. Five people who are at a similar level to you, Peers who can give you the lay of the land in an area of interest or help bounce ideas off one another. And five people who are several levels above you. Potential advocates, mentors, or as I like to call them, guides. These people can help you understand how to reach your desired end destination. If you're solely focused on networking, you can multiply this rule out to seven or even ten. But the 555 rule creates clear guidelines for how to build a well-rounded network until your network begins to build itself going forward. So now you've sent out your invitations and someone responded. The dread kicks in. What do you talk about? I've heard many people say that in order to meet somebody for the first time, you have to provide something of value to them, like a gift. I strongly disagree. In that first meeting, you often won't have anything of value, at least in the traditional sense, to offer. Instead, you're providing them a chance to share that knowledge. And if they're so willing, that's what your meeting is about. And so that's what you focus on. But one thing that you can do and even need to make sure to do is come prepared. There's nothing as frustrating as agreeing to meet with somebody and then realizing they put little to no thought into the conversation in advance. Don't be that person. Instead, you should be knowledgeable about their background and write down questions in advance about that person's experience. You should provide time to give an introduction about yourself and have them introduce themselves too. You should listen closely and ask follow-up questions. You should be personable and be yourself. Remember that the purpose of this meeting is to focus on learning, not favors. If they offer to recommend you for a job or to introduce you to somebody else, take them up on it. But let them take the lead. As you build real relationships with people, it is okay to ask for favors but you should always be ready to give back or to pay it forward. And you need to keep in mind that your network has the right of refusal. One thing you can ask for, even at the end of your first conversation, is whether or not there's somebody else that they would recommend you reach out to. This gives them flexibility in how they respond. If people come to mind, they can provide it immediately. If they want to take time, they can go check in with their network first or they can politely decline. But by giving them that flexibility, you help avoid them feeling trapped because the purpose 
is to build that relationship. One final note, be sure to keep your time commitment. This does not mean cutting them off mid-sentence when you reach the end of your time. Instead, it means let them finish their last thought and say something along the lines of, I've really enjoyed our conversation, but I see we're already at the end of our time. Would it be all right if I followed up? If they have more time, they can offer. However, by ending on time, you're keeping your original commitment to them, you're showing respect, and you're ending the conversation on a thoughtful note. So you had your meeting and the conversation went well, hopefully. Networking doesn't end there. There are short-term actions and long-term considerations you need to make. First, write a thank you email. Include something personal from the conversation, like a story that really resonated with you, or a piece of advice that you really appreciated. Next, you need to DTR. Define the relationship. No, this does not mean calling them and asking them where the relationship is going. Instead, it means taking a careful analysis of the conversation that you had and deciding, is this the type of person who's a potential advocate, a mentor, a friend or peer, an acquaintance? Not all connections are lifelong, and that's okay. But whatever it is, you need to track all of it. Personally, I have an Excel sheet at work where I track how we originally met, the last time we met, and anything else that might be important about that person. It's up to you what's important, but what's essential is having a way to track it because that helps you to remember and to keep in touch, which you'll want to do at least every three to six months. Now, how you keep in touch is up to you, though. With my relationships, I do everything from Zoom catch-ups to coffee chats to lunches together, but I also do text messages and emails that are a little more informal sometimes. I tailor my communication to the person and the relationship that I have with them. I'll send research articles. I'll ask them how their family's doing. I'll give them life updates. I'll ask them about things I'm trying to figure out myself. But you tailor that communication around them. Keeping in touch with hundreds of people is a lot of work, but these are people you know and who know you. It's okay to be imperfect and a work in progress. They are too. For those in person, you may have noticed some cards from Monopoly Bid in your sacks. You don't need to get them out right now, but games were a huge part of my childhood growing up and even now as an adult. In Monopoly, a key part is negotiating to get a complete set of cards, or a Monopoly. For those in person, if you can network during the break to get a complete set of cards, there's a special surprise for you. In life, we all have things to learn, and we all have things to give. We're trying to build complete sets of skills and capabilities. However, unlike in the game of Monopoly, in real life, there are more than enough cards for all of us to succeed. It's just a matter of how difficult we make it. If you have a solar system network where everything revolves around you, you focus on making perfect trades to get to your end destination as quickly as possible. But if you have a network of a community, instead, you focus on helping others as you still try to reach your final destination as well. You get to decide what type of networker you will be. As I mentioned in the beginning, networking isn't just about you. And successful networking should bring value to everyone involved. You shouldn't build a solar system network or a pyramid that lifts you up. Instead, you should build a community concentrated mass of people who support and lift each other up together in order to accomplish more than they can on their own. One of my favorite parts of my network is the ability to learn from a diverse set of skills, experiences, perspectives, and views. 
a good friend and colleague of mine, comes from a very different world than I do. But we both ended up at AT AT&T. We've spent hours learning from each other and bouncing ideas off one another. We have a deep mutual respect, even when we don't see eye to eye. One of the benefits of building a network is those diverse views and experiences that you get to learn from. Pressure testing your assumptions and expanding your view. If you can follow a simple structure like the 555 rule and a way to track and maintain your network, it will surprise you how quickly your network grows. Your knowledge and your ability to see things from more than just your own perspective will grow as well. Before you realize it, you'll have your own magical unicorn network. Thank you.